For tapes, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Friday morning, May the 25th, 2001. Morning service, of Memorial Weekend Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting. Dr. Bill Nell, Salina, Kansas, is the teacher of the morning. Today I, I want to talk to you on, you could title it to walk in freedom, or you could title it to uh, walk with God. But to walk into freedom means that you walk under the covering or under the wing or under the edge of his garment. You know, the word under his wing and the edge of his garment are the same word in the Hebrew. When it says, under his wings you shall take refuge, it means under the corner of his garment. My favorite uh, piece of religious art is one in an Orthodox church. And it showed the return of the prodigal. And the father was depicted as an oriental potentate with the big fur cap on and the great flowing robe. And he wrapped his arms and his robe around the prodigal and took him under the corner of his garment. And that's the way I see the Lord taking me when I came home because I was the prodigal. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I was that prodigal son. And he stared and he waited for me. And he watched for me. And when he saw me coming home, he ran out to greet me. And he greeted me on the other side of the village. And he wrapped his robe around me and he walked me back through the village so that I did not have to walk through the village in shame. <laughs> I did not have to walk through the village in shame. And he carried me back into his house and he told his servants to put a ring on my finger and sandals on my feet and a robe around me because his son who was lost has now come home. Thank you, Lord! I know that I was that prodigal. That's my favorite, my favorite piece of religious art. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Now today we're going to talk about walking, walking freedom. You have to cultivate a close, personal relationship with God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and they will send the Holy Spirit to you. They will send Him out to you, and He will guide you, He'll comfort you, He'll guide you, and He'll empower you. Let's look at John 1, 15, 26. Oh, God, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, that I should tend, presume to open your word without asking for your guidance. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. Lord Jesus, we come to you now. We ask you to open this word to us, Lord God. You open it to us, Lord God. Make it life to us, Lord God. Let it come down into our spirit and breathe life into us. We thank you and we praise you and we bless you and we glorify you, Lord. We thank you. Let your love come down through us, Lord. The love of the Father. In the name of Jesus. We just praise you and bless you and glorify you. In the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, in, in John... 15:26. Here yeah. we see it says, "And when the helper comes, that word helper there in the Greek is Paraclete, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father to testify for me." Now that word can be translated helper or comforter. I want to give you the word picture of a paraclete. In the old Greek city-states, when a man was accused of a crime, he had to stand before the council, and he could no one could speak for him. He had to speak for himself. But he could hire 
the most intelligent person in the realm to stand at his side and whisper in his ear the answers to the questions. And that person who stood at his side was called the paraclete. It means one who comes alongside. And so he's going to send the paraclete. And he will be with you and he will be in you. And he will comfort you and guide you into all truth. And he will comfort you. Okay? Let's, now let's look at John fourteen sixteen. John fourteen sixteen says, And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another helper. Same word. That He may abide with you forever. The Holy Spirit will abide with you forever, unless you walk away from Him. Now, let's look at John sixteen thirteen. John sixteen thirteen says, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will speak, not on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you of things to come. He will glorify Me, and will take of what's mine and declare it to you. And remember that the Holy Spirit never glorifies Himself. He never raises up Himself. He always glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. He does not glorify a ministry. He does not glorify a person. The only person that He glorifies is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you hear prophecy spoken by the Holy Spirit, put that test to it. Does it glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, or does it glorify something else? Glorify something else. It's not the Holy Spirit. Remember, so He says He's going to comfort you, He's going to guide you, and he's going to empower you. Now look at Acts 1.8. He says, But you shall receive power, dunamis, dynamite, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the world. Do you know what that word witness means? Does any of y'all know what the derivation of that word witness is? It comes from the word martyr. You're going to be my martyrs. Hmm. Okay. Praise your Lord God. Now you can compare that with Luke 24, 49, where he says you will stay in Jerusalem until you've endued with power from on high. Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7. Now, here we're talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one of you for the profit of all. And he goes on, he names the twelve gifts then. And the eleventh verse says, But it's the one same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one as He wills. You'll notice that He refers to the Holy Spirit as a person. And He gives the gifts as He wills. Now, He is going to do what the Father and Jesus, because He goes out from both of them, has told him to do. And he'll take from what's Jesus is and give it to you, but he gives it as he wills. I personally believe that there is a protocol within the Godhead. There's the Father and the Son, and then there's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the steward of all God's treasures. And he does what God the Father and God the Son, according to the will of God, and they are in perfect unison, perfect unity, tells him to do. I don't think it's proper to pray to the Holy Spirit. I hear people do this, but I, I can't find in the Bible where, we, where we're told to. I think it's proper to ask God to pour out his anointing, which is the Holy Spirit. And I asked Jesus. Jesus said, I will pray the Father and he will send him. But I don't think it's proper to pray to the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a personal thing. I don't know of any scripture that says you do not do this. Okay? 
And I've had people say, well, it doesn't say not to. And I don't want to get into an argument over my supposition. That's a supposition that I make. Lots of other people have the same, feel the same way. Okay, let's go on. Now, if I step on your stoves, I'm sorry, I apologize. I say that's a personal supposition. I do not, I do not quote it in Scripture. But I think it is correct. Okay. The, uh, and so, the Holy Spirit is sent out from God to comfort you, to guide you, to empower you, and to convict you. Okay. Let's look at John 16, verse 11. You should really read the 14th, 15th, and 16th verses of John if you want to be familiar with the Holy Spirit. John 16, 8 says, He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they don't believe in me or don't have faith in me. Of righteousness because I will go to the Father and you will see me no more. And of judgment, because the ruler's world stands judged. The Holy Spirit will convict your conscience. And He speaks to you in a small, still, quiet voice. But He will convict you by your conscience. Now, your conscience will convict you. But the Holy Spirit will speak to your conscience and convict you of sin. And so, you cultivate a relationship of listening and being obedient to the Holy Spirit when He speaks to you. He is the mouthpiece of God. He does not speak in an audible voice most of the time. Most of the time, He speaks to you through the intuition of your spirit. It's a gentle, delicate, whispering voice. And it comes up. And you hear it. Now, how do you cultivate a close relationship with Him? Well, you don't grieve Him. You can grieve Him. You can insult Him. Well, how do you grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, let's look at the at uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse, starting with verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for the necessary edification or building up that it may impart grace to the hearers. My mother used to say, if you can't say something good, don't say anything at all. And that's basically what it says here. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed on the day of redemption. Let all bitterness or rebellion, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking, when you see evil speaking, think cursing, be put away from you with all malice. But be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving, just as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. So it gives you some things there that you you look at those and you say, hmm. Those are the things that grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, they are sins that will separate you from God. And it grieves the Holy Spirit when you do these things. When you feel... Okay, let's go. Let's, uh, let's look at to quench the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. And I think it starts with 15. 5, 15 to 19. 22, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but pursue what is good both for yourself and for all. Rejoice always and pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. How many times have you seen in the Bible when something says this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you? There are four places where it says this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And one of them is that you give thanks in everything. Thanksgiving brings deliverance. You know when Job got vomited up out of the whale? When he said, Thank you, God. I will fulfill my vow. Thank you, God. And the fish vomited him out on the dry ground. Took him three days to come to the point that he could say, God, I'm going to do it. Thank you, Lord. And he vomited him up. Read it. It's there. Praise you, Lord Jesus. But if you do these things, said, don't, dis- don't quench the Spirit, don't despise prophesying, test all things, hold fast with it, and abstain from every form of evil. Now, those, that's a way of living. And those are all sins, and you know they're sins. And if you do them, you will quench the Holy Spirit. Now, how do you insult the Holy Spirit? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. 
For if we willfully sin, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose he will be thought word of who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of grace? That means if you continue, uh, I'll give you an example. I was ministering to a young engaged couple. They were, had their wedding set up and they were engaged and they were going to get married. But they were having some problems in their life with compulsive activity. And I was asked by the pastor to counsel them. And I was praying with them and God gave me a vision. And I saw this young couple going into a motel. And there was a clock up there by the door that told me the time and day. And the room number. And I saw them go in and shut the door. And so I looked at them and I said, uh, you know, I just had a very interesting vision. I saw you people last Saturday at 3 p.m. going into room number 8 and I named the motel. I said, what would you all do in there when you closed the door? And there was some sort of foot shuffling and, <laughs> and, uh, and some looking down. And I said, uh, well... And the, and the girl said, well, we repent afterwards. We confess it as sin and repent afterwards. I said, you do that every Saturday? Yeah. I said, don't you realize that you've insulted God? You get out on your knees and say, we're sorry, God, and we're going to repent. We repent. When repent means that you're going to turn away and not doing it, and no full well next Saturday you're going to be back there. So don't you realize you're insulting God? That's an insult to God. That's just an insult. And that's what it means to insult the Holy Spirit. Knowing full well, I'm not talking about the poor person who's in bondage to cigarettes and who is trying to quit smoking and is praying to God for a spirit of repentance and they throw that thing down and they make a vow and they, and they try and they try and they try and then they fail. Okay. I don't think they've insulted God. I think God weeps a little bit. He's sorry for them. But there comes a time that He will grant them repentance and deliverance. There comes a time that He will grant them repentance. It took five years for me. It took me five years to stop smoking. When I got saved, I got rid of drinking and cussing and a lot of things that ain't even polite to talk about. But cigarette smoking took five years laying on my face crying out to God. And then one day it disappeared. I was like Mark Twain. I quit a thousand times. I'd quit at 8 o'clock in the morning. By noon, I'd be over there. I'd throw them all away. I'm not going to smoke anymore in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and by noon, I'd be over there straightening out this butt in the ashtray, you know, <laughs> trying to light one. I mean, they just sort of sucked me over there, you know. And the, uh, But when he set me free, he set me free. He set me free. I didn't know what deliverance was, and I just knew to lay on my face and cry out for mercy. And he granted me repentance. Repentance is a gift from God to be able to turn and walk away from your sin. And you need to seek God's face for it. If perhaps God says in Second Timothy, if Second Timothy two twenty five, if perhaps God will grant them the spirit of repentance. He says godly sorrow leads to salvation, to repentance which brings salvation. Worldly sorrow leads to death. Okay, let's go on here. Okay, so you don't insult the Holy Spirit. Now, to willfully and repeatedly grieve, insult, and quench the Holy Spirit can bring on a wilderness experience. Now, a wilderness experience, I listened to Graham Cook uh, speak about wilderness experiences. And he says you go into a wilderness experience for two reasons. One is you've been stupid. And I thought that was a little hard, harsh, you know. I thought, you know, maybe foolish would have been a better a word to use. But Graham used the word stupid. And I thought, well, you know, maybe foolish would have been a better word. But then I looked up the word foolish in the Bible, and it comes from the word moronic, which from which we get moron. But, you know, foolish is a much nicer word. Stupid is blunt. <laughs> I'd be diplomatic and say foolish. But you go into a will experience because you've been foolish and you've willfully sinned and you won't come out of your sin. 
And you may go into a wilderness experience until God gets your attention. Until He gets your attention. Until you come to the end of yourself. To the absolute end of yourself. And you lay on your face and you cry out to God and say, Lord. The other wilderness experience is where God wants to bring you to a little higher level. And He just sort of withdraws back and doesn't talk to you. And He wants you to walk it out by faith. You don't feel like He's within 500 yards of you or 500 miles. I went through one of these once and I, I was able to, to pray for people and people got delivered and healed and, and so forth. But I didn't feel, I mean, I felt like I was praying for a broomstick. But people got healed and so forth and God was just nowhere and He lasted for two years. But he brought me to a place to work out some things that he wanted me to work out in my life. And he wanted to bring me up to a higher level to show me something new and different. But I had to realize it was him and not me. I had to come to an end of myself there knowing it wasn't me was the reason that I got this. It was because he wanted me there. You know, Jesus went into a wilderness experience after he was baptized. Now, Mark says he was driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Matthew and Luke are a little kind of say he was led. But he was taken into the Holy Spirit and left into the wilderness for 40 days and he ate nothing and he was uh, there with the wild beast and ministered to by the angels. But when he came out, he came out in a new level in the power of the Spirit. His miracle ministry began after the wilderness experience. Now, and so, if you repeat it, but... For our purposes today, we we'll say that if you repeatedly insult, grieve, quench the Spirit of God, you may come into a wilderness experience where you're going to be on your face saying, Oh, God, well, you will eventually come to the end of yourself. And that is a, as Graham Cook says, that nobody really should have to go through that. That is a foolish place to allow yourself to be put. So, how do you know that you've walked away from God's covering? How do you know that the Holy Spirit, that you've walked away from the covering, that you're not in a close communion with Him anymore? What happens to you? How can you tell? Well, let's look at a few Scriptures. Number one, let's look at the covering first. He says He covers you with His wing. Now, the most there are a number of scriptures. Psalms 91 4. You all know Psalm 91. He says, He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wing you shall take refuge. Remember, I told you that under the wing means the corner of His garment. It says the same thing in Psalms 63 7 and 17 8. That under the shadow of His wings you shall take refuge. Now, Jesus alluded to this. In Luke 13.34, let's look at that. In Luke 13.34, Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. It says the same thing in Matthew 37-39. But Jesus said He wanted to gather you like a, under His wings, the wing of God. Now, let's look at Isaiah chapter 30. And him, the prophet Isaiah, speaks to rebellious children. He says, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not of me, who devise a covering but not of my spirit. Now that covering is a spider's web. It means literally to weave a spider's web. They add sin to sin. They go down to the world and have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves in the strength of the devil, Pharaoh. To trust in the shadow of Egypt, therefore the strength of the devil and shall be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of the world shall be your humiliation. Egypt, of course, being the world and Pharaoh being the devil. And so, when you devise plans that are not of God, of His Spirit, how many of y'all ever done that? Well, by gosh, I'm going to get Him. 
I'm going to make so much money, boy, he's going to have to come to me. Hmm? None of y'all ever built any castles like it. I'm the only one that's ever done that. Hmm? Oh, you just wait. I should have told him. This is what I should have told him. I should have told him, and you come up with the best answer. Of course, it happened a week ago, you know. And you got this fine answer for him. That this is it. Then he would have said, "Don't ever done that." That's called fantasy, and that is weaving a spider's web. Going out there and go ask your friends and tell your friends about it, and they tell you what you should have done and how you should have gotten him. And maybe you devise a plan to get even. Okay, you're out there in the world listening to the devil, taking his advice. And that's going to be your shame and your humiliation. Because the devil is sitting up over that spider's web, just looking. He's got this long spear. got this demon sitting up his long spear. And he just sits down and he just, and you, Oh, God! Oh, I'm wounded, Lord! I'm wounded! Help me, Lord! Oh, God! And you go back up on the, get over here, Oh, God! Help me! And God's going to heal you. He'll heal you. Cry. He'll, he cries. It just hurts him to see you be so foolish. And I'm the only one this sort of thing's ever happened to. Now, this is what happens when you walk away from the wing of God and get out of that spider web and start devising your own plans, not of His Spirit. Going to get even. Going to show Him or her or whatever or them. Okay. Instead of holding them up to God and say, God, bless those people, Lord Jesus, just bless them. But what does it say here? Turn your, open your Bibles to Second to First Peter, chapter 2. 1 Peter, chapter 2, starting with verse 18 to get the context. Servants, be submissive to your masters. Or you could say, workers, be submissive to your, to your hirers, to your bosses, with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For it is commendable if because of conscience toward God one endures grief and suffers wrongly. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer for it, and if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. You want to be commendable before God? Pray for those people who use you and abuse you and spitefully use you. But you may be a son of your, or a daughter of your father who is in heaven. He goes on to say that for this you were called. You called for that. Because Jesus also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and was no gal found in his mouth. But when he was reviled, did not revile in return, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to he who judges righteously. For he himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that having died to sins and lived for righteousness, and by whose stripes you were healed. Thank you, Lord. Now, and so if you walk away and form your own thing, then you're going to walk out from under the covering of God. How do you know you're out there? before the devil gets you with that big old spear and wounds you. Okay? Let's look at some verses here now. I want to look at, go through rather quickly. Look at Romans. Wait, I'm going, Brother Glenn. We ain't going to be through before 2 or 1 o'clock. Romans chapter 8. Yeah, I'm only on page 1. <laughs> There's about... A few more there. <laughs> All right, page uh, page eight fourteen. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received a spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Okay, you didn't receive a spirit of bondage again to fear which meant that you were in bondage to fear before you were saved. That's what it means. Now, let's look over in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Start at the... Uh, we'll read the whole verse. Get the context. Insomuch then as children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise shared the same in the same, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who 
through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And he goes on to say, For he does not give aid to angels, but gives aid to the seed of Abraham. And you are the seed of Abraham. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you be the seed of Abraham. Galatians 3, 19 or 20. Okay. And so, now let's look at 1 John chapter 4. Chapter 3. I'm sorry. Verse 8. For he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of Man was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, that word destroy there is the same word as loosed in binding and loosening. It's the same word. Jesus came that he might loose you from the works of the devil. That is the fear of death, being in bondage to fear. But he sent a spirit of adoption of love into your heart, of His love for you, the Father's love. Okay, now let's look at, uh, keep in 1 John 4, 16 to 18. For we know and believe the love of God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in Him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we have the boldest in the day of judgment because we are as He is and so we are in the world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Okay. Now, so the first thing that happens to you when you move away from God, fear of death comes in. Fear begins to move back in. Fear of death. You begin to move away out of out from under his wing. And you don't feel his accepting love. Instead, rejection comes back in. You fear that you are being rejected or you have been rejected or you are not loved or things are not right. Now, let's look at First Corinthians chapter thirteen. Well let's look at uh sorry, let's look at first Timothy first. Oh, look at Timothy. It's 2 Timothy, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Now, that word sound mind, if you've got a new international version, says of uh, power, love, and self-control. I like the word self-control better because it puts it a little more in context. You have control. And so when you move away from God, fear comes back in. No longer do you feel power, love, and self-control. Sound mind. And look, let's look now at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And this is the way I understand it. Chapter 13, verse 13. Now by the faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. And so when you walk out from under the covenant, fear replaces love. You lose your hope. Hope is for tomorrow. Faith is for today. Hope is for tomorrow. Love is forever. And the unqualified, unconditional love of the Father drives out fear and rejection. You see, your birthright from Adam, from your father Adam, was rejection. Know that your nativity was rejection. Canaanites, rejected and despised. Your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite. That's pride and terror. Those were your, those, that's your birthright. And I'm going to, Lord, I'm going to, what I'm going to talk about this afternoon, but I never need to get off of this. I preach it all now. <laughs> but that comes back when you move away from sonship. Out from under the wing. Fear comes back in. You lose your hope. And you have trouble standing in faith. That's when you know that you've moved away from God. That's when you know that you've moved away from God. And you say, Lord, how do I come back? Paul was acutely aware of this. 
And he knew that he had to maintain a conscience clear for fence. And so, let's look at Acts 26, verse 1. 23, I'm sorry. Let's look at Acts 23, verse 1. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, now he is standing before the Sanhedrin, and said, Men and brothers, I have lived in all good conscience before God till this day. He said, I stand here with a clear conscience before God to this day. Now, I want you to notice what happens in the next verse. The high priest said, Strike him on the mouth. And Paul looked up at him and he reviled the high priest. He said, How dare you order stand there to judge me by the law and order me struck contrary to the law. And the man next to him said, You dare revile God's high priest? And Paul said, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I apologize. I didn't know he was the high priest. For it is written, You shall not speak evil of the ruler of the people. Don't speak evil of the ruler of the people. All number, all authority is raised up by God. They're there because God placed them there. Now, Paul repented immediately. You want to maintain a clear conscience? Repent. The minute you're convicted of sin, even though it may be a little embarrassing. I used to have a trouble with being a uh, telling tall tales. You know, that's a polite way of saying it, lying. And I could tell the most exaggerating tales. I was just the best storyteller. But the problem with that is it, you get to where that pops over into your life and you uh, sometimes you stretch what happened. And God told me I had to stop and I was having trouble. And He said, what I want you to do is that when you do that, I want you to apologize to them immediately and ask them to forgive you for lying to them. Now, friends, I tell you, you do that three or four times. You get to where you keep your tongue straight. <laughs> You're looking at somebody and say, I am terribly sorry, but I lied to you. That's not what really happened. This was what happened. Please forgive me for exaggerating to you and being dishonest. Will you please forgive me? Now, you do that a couple times to somebody, and you know, you keep, you, you know, and, and say, God, please help me. I can't do it without you. You're the one. You're the only one. Only the Holy Spirit can control the tongue. It is unworldly, unwieldy, and full of evil. No man can tame the tongue. All kind of wild beasts have been tamed, but nobody can tame the tongue. That's what James says. And praise God. But repent immediately. God tells you to give you something unpleasant to do, do it. You will learn from it. Praise you, Lord God. I've got written down Proverbs 12.25. Now, I wonder what that is. I knew what it was. Let's see. 12.25. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. Now, anxiety is fear. Fear coming into your heart will cause heaviness and depression. That's the reason you get depressed when you're rejected. The fear comes in, and that depression or heaviness will come in with it. That's in the Word of God. Praise the Lord. Okay. Now, we know that, uh, I want you to look at Exodus uh, 22:28. It says, You shall not revile God, nor curse the ruler of your people. And Paul interpreted that curse, that word curse, by saying you shall not speak evil. Uh, that's the reason I tell you, when you see it says evil speaking, think curse. Because Paul, on the unction of the Holy Spirit, interpreted that curse to evil speaking. Okay. Y'all, y'all buy that. Okay. Now, it says in uh, Romans uh, 13, 1, 2, and 3, that it says uh, that all authority emanates from God's throne, and He raises up all the world rulers and you to, to obey them. In Ecclesiastes 10, 20, it says, Don't curse the king even in your thoughts. Don't even think anything bad. When Bill Clinton was president, I told people not even think bad thoughts about him. Pray for the man. Pray for him. God raised him up. I remember them in the morning eight years ago when uh, we were getting ready to vote, you know, and the pastor's wife asked me, said, Doc, what's going to happen? I said, I really don't know. I went home and I began to pray, and I prayed. And I said, God, what's going to happen? 
And he said to me, Oh, quiet voice, the country is going to get what it deserves. I said, Oh, God, don't do that to us. Give us grace, Lord. Don't give us what we deserve, Lord. Don't give us what we deserve. Give us grace. Well, we got what we deserve. Now we need to pray that God will bless that man. Wherever he is, last I heard, last heard somebody was throwing an egg at him someplace. Before that, he was riding an elephant someplace. Let's God protect him and bless him and bring him to salvation. Just bless him. Bless him. Ask God to bless him. God's going to do with him as he sees fit. And when you pray blessings on people that have returned evil for good, did you know that your, that your prayer will come back into your own bosom? Is that so in the Psalms? Psalms. Let's look at that. 34. Psalms. Uh, Psalm 35. I humbled. He says, verse 12. Psalm 35, verse 12. They reward me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. The people don't ever reward somebody evil for good because Scripture says that evil will not depart from your house. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own bosom, a heart. Bosom. I mean, you pray for those people. You know, God, if you put that prayer out and God doesn't think they deserve it, He'll send it back to you. Now, that's, you know, now you just think about the kind of prayer you're praying. Think about the kind of prayer you're praying. You want that to come back on you? That's a good general principle. When you're praying for somebody, ask to God, do I want that kind of prayer to come back on me? If you don't want that to come back on you, don't pray it for somebody else. Because it very well can. The uh, witch doctor, the curse caster, was a good friend of mine. And he said uh, he always investigated very carefully before he put a curse out. Before he got saved, he was a professional. He was a curse caster. His father before him had been a curse caster. And he lived in Minneapolis, and he would go out to this uh, place where there was an uh, old the underground railway used to be, uh, where they had the slaves transported north and across the border. And he said it was an old run-down building, and it was all broken down. But he found it was a very good place to cast curses. He carried his wife out there. He said, this is wonderful. His wife said, this is the creepiest place I've ever been in. I'm going to go sit in the car. And she, he'd build his altar and put his black candles up there. And he would enchant his curse, and his black cloud would come up over the altar, and when he finished the curse, the cloud would go out. He said after he got saved, he got before God and tried to rebuke as many of those as he could remember he had done. But God set him free. And, uh, but he said he always investigated very carefully the point of the whole story, is that, uh, that if the person, if there was no place for this curse to light, you see... Uh, Proverbs 28 said, A curse causely shall not light. If there's no place for it to light, it would come back and light on him. And he didn't want them coming back on him. So he always very careful about who he sent curses out against. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Okay, let's go back in now about a clear conscience. Let's look at Acts 24, verse 16. In him, Paul is giving his testimony before Felix. In verse 16 he says, well, let's start verse 15. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense between God and man. Now, last time he said, I'm trying to keep a clear conscience before God. Now he says, I'm trying to keep a clear conscience before God and men. I don't want anything between me and anybody. Now, if you look at that, then you look back at Matthew chapter 6, and you can understand what it says. Let's look back at Matthew chapter 20, chapter 5, I'm sorry. Chapter 5. And it says, starting with verse... Uh, 22. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause, and the majority text omits without a cause, shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and remember that your brother's got something against you, 
Leave your gift before the altar. Go your way. First be reconciled with your brother, then come off of your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the office, and you be thrown into prison. Most assuredly, I say, you will, you will no wise get out until you pay the last penny. And what does all that mean? That means that if there is something between you and someone else, try to settle it. Even if you've got to take the blame, try to settle it. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 6. But a brother goes to law against a brother, and that before one believers. Now, therefore, it is already a utter failure for you do, for you that you go to the law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be defrauded? No, you yourselves do wrong and defraud. You do these things to your brethren. What Paul's saying is that uh, forgive. Forgive. Now, the Bible says that uh, you should... It says in, uh, in Romans, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Now, there are sometimes people that you get somebody that you can't settle it. You know, I tell the, 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 tell the story of the man that I had a disagreement with, and it turned out that, that he was right. I was wrong, but we were on a committee and we, we took up a subject and we and and I and the majority voted one way and he wanted to go the other way. And I and so there, it was only him that wanted to go the other way. And there were nine other people. And so I said, Well, I guess, you know, I was chairman of the committee and so I ruled for the majority. And he got me outside, and he got his finger in my face, and he told me, by gosh, he was going to get even with me for this. And, you know, I went home, and I prayed about it, and God showed me he was really right, that the committee was wrong. So I called him on the phone and told him I was sorry. But, you know, the rules, by Robert's rules of order, that was all I could do. And he still said, I'm going to get you, boy. I'm going to get you for this. I'm going to get you. Well... And he went through a long series of health problems. And I went to his bedside and prayed for him. And I called him and asked him if I'd come pray for him. He said, yes. And I prayed for him. And God raised him up and prayed for him. And God raised him up and prayed for him. And God raised him up. And after a series of operations and a heart attack and a stroke, and God had raised him up out of all of this, we were sitting together talking and this thing came up somehow. And a cloud settled over him. And his jaw got set. And he stared and he looked at me. He pointed his finger and said, I'm going to get you yet. It's not over. I mean, the devil is destroying the man. Man carry a grudge for 25 years. Now, you, you know, I've done all I can do. I'm at peace with him. Although I can't help him, I prayed for him. I've done everything I can do for him. I'm at peace with him. I've got a clear conscience in that situation. There comes a time that some people just won't. But if you don't make an effort, then He will turn you over because if you don't make an effort, then you don't have peace before God and you get turned over to the tormentors until you pay the last farthing. That's what that means. It was, I never, I, I mean, I've read that thing interpreted a dozen different ways and that was fine. That's the way it, that's the way it is, people. That's the way it is. That's the way I think that's the correct interpretation. And if you want to walk with Jesus and have a clear conscience, have a clear conscience before God and before men. Let the sun go down on your anger. Don't carry unforgiveness. Try to be at peace with all people, even if it means you're going to be defrauded. Let God be your protector and your, and your defender. Let the Holy Spirit defend you. I was unjustly accused some years ago and lied about. It made the newspapers. I had people from far as away as Oregon, right in Washington, write me and tell me that they were praying for me and standing with me in this terrible ordeal because they heard it on the newspaper, out of the newspaper and the TV and the, and the radio. And, 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 and it was all a lie. But you know what? God defended me. 
I never opened my mouth. The pastor said, well, I said, Doc, that's a bunch of lies, isn't it? I said, yes. That's what I've been telling people. I said, well, I, but I never opened my mouth to defend myself except at the hearing when I was forced to testify on that. And God defended me then. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Remember that retained anger is unforgiveness. Now, if you're angry with someone, someone's hurt you, and you're angry with them, and a lot of us have been hurt. I mean hurt bad. We've had bad things happen to us when we were children. Bad things happen in bad marriages. Bad things happen with our parents, with our, with our grandparents. Horrible things that should never have happened. What does Jesus say about those? Forgive them. Pray for them. That's what he says. If you retain unforgiveness, retained anger is unforgiveness. What is unforgiveness? It's the desire. What is unforgiveness? Desire for vengeance. That's Webster's Dictionary. To forgive means to give up the right to revenge. For vengeance. Because the Bible says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Vengeance belongs to God, just like forgiveness. You want vengeance, you're stealing from God. You're a thief. You're in rebellion. And God will punish you. God won't, He won't punish you, but He will turn, He will allow the tormentors to punish you. That says so in Matthew 18. Let's look at that. I can quote you all other places where it says you're supposed to forgive, but y'all all know all those verses. But look at Matthew 18. 1834. Starting with verse 32. And the master, after he called, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave all that debt because you begged me to. Should you have not also had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And the master was angry and delivered him to the torturers, the tormentors, the jailers, depending on your translation, until he should pay all that was due him. And so my heavenly Father will also do to each of you, if each of you, from your heart, does not forgive his brother his trespasses. How you forgive from your heart? Well, well, I've said, I forgive, I forgive, I forgive, and it still hurts. Start praying for him. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 5. You want to be healed? Follow the compassion of God. Every time in the Bible, if you will go through, it says Jesus saw the multitude and he had compassion upon them. That is a very strong word. It means to be moved in the bowels. He had com- and he healed them all. He saw the multitude. And the Spirit of God was there to heal them. And he healed them all. Whenever you people, whenever you feel God's compassion, God's love, God's compassion for someone, you feel a poor outpouring of God's compassion, if you follow it and act on it, you'll see a miracle. You'll see a miracle. When God's love is poured out and you feel God's love and compassion for someone, you follow it and pray for them, you'll see a miracle. You'll get blessed. Somebody's going to get healed. Might be you. We've already looked at Ephesians chapter 4, 26 and 27. We looked at Matthew 18, 34 and 35. Now let's look at Matthew 5, 25 and 26. Okay, we've already done that one. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 48, the one I was looking for. You have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, you shall love your neighbor, love your enemies, and do bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. And if you look at Luke chapter 6, verses 27, 28, and verses 35, they say the same thing. People, when you can get on your knees and labor in spirit, and labor in the spirit for your enemies, and ask God to bless them. He will heal you. He will heal you. You'll find that you get healed. Now, your enemies may get saved too, but you've got to labor for them that they will get healed, that they will get saved. And when you do that, that compassion, and be moved in the bowels that they will 
come out of their sin and be healed. God will touch you and heal you, and suddenly that pain will be gone. Now, if you rejoice when something happens to them, that displeases God very badly. The worst curse in the Bible was the curse God placed on Edom because the people of Edom saw Jerusalem fall and they rejoiced. And they sent their army out to cut off the Jews so they couldn't get away from the slaughtering Roman army. So the Romans could slaughter the Jews. And they rejoiced in this. And the curse and God pronounced them holo and bolo. And today the land of Edom is a howling wasteland full of tar pits. And nothing lives there. It was a prosperous nation. Nothing lives in the, in the historical land of Edom today. The word the, the Pelta or Pelta, some city out in the middle of the desert that, that was in the big carved out of the mountains. And there are, people used to think that that's where the Christians were going to go during the tribulation because it was a narrow place. Nobody could get in there because nobody can live there because there's no water there or anything else. It's just the sand. The whole nation is gone. They were cursed by God's prophet. He pronounced a curse, pronounced holo and bolo, and it came to pass. And it came to pass because they rejoiced over the fall of Jerusalem and cut off God's people so they couldn't get away. Don't, when your enemies, when you see your enemies having trouble, pray for them. Don't rejoice. Praise and bless and glorify your Lord God. And so, now we've talked about things that grieve the Holy Spirit. We've talked about Ephesians 4.31. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, that's loud quarreling. Cursing or evil speaking and malice, which means ill will. Just bad. In Ephesians 5, 19 to 24, we find a code of description of how we should act. And these are all guidelines that are given to you by the Spirit. And these are written down for something. This book is, is something that you can check your conduct by. It's perfect and it's holy. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit, but it is a book of promises. And Ephesians 5.19 says, Speaking to another one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melodies hard, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father. Again, there's a giving of thanks. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. You know, I walked down the hall. I memorized about a dozen old hymns. When I walked down the hall at the hospital, I sang to myself. When I home and I sang, A mighty fortress is our God. I sing the blood of Jesus. I sing about the blood. I sing about... I just sing all these, all these old hymns I memorized when I was a boy. I just hum them and sing them. And I pray in tongues. I was walking down the hall one day, and I just sort of humming along and humming along, and I just stopped. Something stopped me. And the Spirit of God spoke to me. Just go in that room and pray for that child. I didn't know anything about that child. I just stopped and turned and looked in, and there was this little three-month-old child who was three or four months old, about this long. Looked horrible. Just looked horrible. He's gasping, sort of gray-looking. I couldn't imagine why he was in the room by himself. And so I spoke life to him. I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, live. I bind the spirit of death. And I speak healing and restitution in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Live, be healed, and live in Jesus' name. And then I walked out. What I didn't know was, that the grandfather was in the bathroom. And he had the door cracked a little bit. And he heard someone walk in and say to his grandchild, Live! And they had told him that this child was going to die. That there wasn't anything else that could be done. And somebody says, Live! And he walks out, and as soon as he can get himself presentable, he comes out and he looks and he saw if he's Mike the heel as I go around the corner. And so he runs down to the corner, and I've got on the stairs and gone. 
And he came out, you know, and he looked at his child first, and the child was sitting up shaking the bed. Well, maybe he was older than four months old. I don't know. I got this story third and fourth hand now. And he said, that, well, who was that? An angel came into the room and spoke to my child. And said, there was no angel. It was Dr. Null. Just went down. <laughs> so, about four months later, the pastor says to me that... Uh, the uh, pastor in a neighboring town was counseling a uh, gentleman who was backslidden on a certain denomination on, that did not believe that healing was for today. He wanted to know about healing in the fullness of the Spirit. Now, that man has got one of the largest charismatic churches in town today, and he's been there four years. He spoke to my son. He relayed the story to my son. That's how I can tell it. I've never met the man. But it's because I stopped and I looked at that child and I felt the compassion of God. First I was told to go and pray to him, but I just felt the compassion of God. I have just looked in and seen people and just feel God's compassion and just go in and pray for them. And I've seen the dead raised. I went in and prayed for this one child who had encephalitis and was supposed to be... And had been in coma for 30 days, you know, and they told the parents that they were going to send him home, that he'd never wake up. And I just went in and looked at his mother, and I felt God's compassion, you know. And I didn't know these people. I didn't know who they were. And he said, he said, do you mind if I pray for your son? He said, I guess it's all right. They say he's going to die. Go ahead. What's her attitude? I prayed for the child, and God raised him up. And she was going to bring him to the full... I went over to this little town where she lives about a year later, and she was bringing him to the full gospel businessmen's association so I could see him, and I got up and spoke against abortion, and she got up and took her child and left. Grabbed him by that little four-year-old kid, grabbed him by the arm, boy, and just stormed out. I said, God bless her. Make a long story short, her husband then got some type of pneumonia and was dying in the hospital and I went by and prayed for him and God raised him up too. His, the husband wrote me a letter and told me the nurses said you came in and prayed for me and I want to thank you for it. This lady's never said anything to me. Matter of fact, she didn't look like she wanted to give me permission to pray for her husband. <laughs> but praise God. Uh, we're getting a little astray. I'm sorry. All right. Now, We've gone over most of these verses before. In Ephesians 5, 12 to 22, we find instructions to esteem those who are over us in the Lord, to comfort the faint-hearted, to uphold the weak, and be patient with all. Render no one evil for evil, Romans 12, 17 says. Pursue what's good for all those and rejoice always in Ephesians. Pray without ceasing and give thanks for all things. That's Ephesians 4. Four, I mean, five four Colossians four two Ephesians five twenty. Don't despise prophecy. Don't despise prophecy. Now let's look at Second Chronicles twenty twenty. Now here in Second Chronicles, the good King Jehoshaphat has heard that a mighty army is coming, one that he cannot stand against, and he called the people to fast. Second Chronicles twenty twenty, and he called the army. He called everybody to fast. And they got the word of knowledge that they were coming down a certain valley, but not to worry that the battle was the Lord's. And so the next morning they went out to meet him, and they said they sent the praisers out first. Now, what kind of army is going to send the band out first, besides the Scots and the bagpipes? And what did it say? And they rose early in the morning and went out to Willis Topeka and they went out of... Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. Don't despise prophesying people. Believe God's prophets, and you shall prosper. Now, Hebrews 10.36 says that if we continue to willfully sin, then we've insulted God. If so stubborn, through stubborn willfulness, we persist in sin. Now, there's another example of that. Let's look at Genesis chapter 4. Here we have the example of Cain and Abel. God has sacrificed, had, they both have sacrificed God's accepted Abel's sacrifice, which meant the fire came from heaven and consumed it. But Cain offered his own sacrifice, 
and God did not honor it. And so when the Lord said to Cain, verse 6, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and any desire is for you, and you should rule over it. Now that word sin there, this translated sin, comes from the acacia word for demon. Now, I asked my son, he said, Oh, Dad, you remember when I took you through the Museum of Natural History in, in England? And we went through the, through the Assyrian portion. He said, You remember those funny-looking things that uh, stood outside, those funny-looking things that were outside the, the buildings that had a, had a stick in one hand with a pine cone on it and a basket in the other? And they were... I said, yeah, those demon things. He said, that's right. That's what that is. Those are the demon gods that protect the building. And if you make a proper propitiation, a proper sacrifice to the gods that control them, that demon will be kind, malevolent, be benevolent to you. But if you do not, he will be a malevolent, an angry being. Well, now, what's he going to say? They always wondered, said the People who looked at it always wondered what this shaft with the pine cone on is and what this basket is. I said, anybody can tell you that. I mean, if you don't mind, he wants to give you the shaft with that bugger. And the basket is, he holds it up and you get to stick your hand in it. You don't know what's in there. When you're dealing with the devil, you know, you don't know what's in that basket. It may be a, it may be a snake going to bite your hand. Mm-hmm. You don't know what you're going to get at the devil's trading book. Well, let's go on here. Sin lies at the door, and it sh- but you should rule over it. You should rule over the demons. And you notice there is no answer. Cain did not answer God. He was stubborn and willful. He said, okay, Abel, let's go out to the field. He took him out and killed him. So through stubborn willfulness, if you through stubborn willfulness continue in your sin, and so how... So let's look back now. How do you walk in the Spirit? You walk in the Spirit by cultivating a relationship with the Holy Ghost that that God the Father and God the Son has sent out to comfort you, to empower you, to guide you, and to convict you. You don't willfully insult Him by being loud, clamorous, cursing, unforgiving. And when He convicts you of sin, you maintain a clear conscience before God. Now remember that the blood, Hebrews chapter 9 says, the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And so you, you can maintain a clear conscience before God and before men. You settle offenses. Even it means you take a loss. Because if you are reviled for doing good, and you take it well, that is commendable before God. For what you were called, and Jesus gave you an example, that you might follow in His footsteps. Five minutes. Praise the Lord. Five minutes. Hallelujah. Well, and so, how do you... Praise you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. So, what do you do? You confess your sin. You repent from sin. Just remember, 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hebrews 9, 15 to 17 says the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Forgive those who have hurt or offended you. Give up anger and revenge and pray for your enemies. Give up your desire for revenge. That's the true forgiveness. And you ask God to do that. You can't do it by yourself. It's a gift from God. It says in Daniel 9, 9, that forgiveness belongs to God. Vengeance and forgiveness belong to God. You want forgiveness? You won't be able to forgive? Ask God to give you a spirit of forgiveness. Let it come into your heart. Now, it's an act of your will. You have to pursue after it. But God will give it to you. God will give it to you. He wants to work in your, in your heart. He wants to work in your character. Break any curses on you that might arise from your sin. If you've been out 
and done something that brings you under the curse of the law. And what brings you under the curse of the law? Food sacrificed to idols, idolatry, fornication. And fornication is a good old Greek word. It comes from the word porneo, from which we get pornography. And if you want to know what it means, look at uh, the beer ads. That's pornography all the way down yonder to Husla. And the worst bestiality you can think of. And that's what porneo includes. It includes idolatry, too. All right, so idolatry, fornication, drinking and eating of blood, the eating of meat that's been strangled has still got the blood in it. Those are the things. He said, will lay on you no greater burden than these necessary things. They'll bring you under the curse of the law. You want to read about the curse of the law? Read Deuteronomy 28. There's 15 page, 15 verses of blessings and then goes on for 60 to 65 verse for curses. A lot more curses. Remember that the Holy Spirit speaks to the intuition of your conscience. If this window is dirty with unconfessed, unresented sin, it will block communication with the Holy Spirit. And you rejoice with thanksgiving, Philippians 5.5 5 and 1 Thessalonians 5.18. I tell you people, rejoice always. And again I say rejoice. Amen. Let your prayers and petitions be known to God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God that passeth it all understand will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That means guard, garrison. That word guard means to encircle around it. Not let anything out, not let anything in. Put it under siege. I mean, nothing can get in there when the Holy Spirit is, gar- is garrisoning your, guarding your heart. And the peace of God that passeth it all understanding will be with you. Whatever is noble, whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever good report, think on these things. And that's where your self-control comes in. Think of those things. And the peace of God will be with you. When your peace is gone, you know you've moved away from God. When you start losing your peace, and you start losing your joy, and you start losing your hope, and then you're not able to stand in faith, means you're out here someplace and... Uh, and the wings over there somewhere, you need to get back over him. And to do that, you need to confess your sin and come back to God. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord. Hallelujah. And praise you and bless you and glorify you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. Please all stand up now. And the last thing, of course, is read the Bible daily. Pray and meditate. Have a quiet time. Have a routine of regular fasting. Have fellowship with believers. It says, I tell you people, you you lay out, you stand out there by yourself. There ain't no long rangers in this business. You want to be a long ranger? The devil will pick you off so quick and make your head swim. Get you under country. So you have fellowship, he says in Hebrews ten thirty five, forget not. Forget not to meet together. And then have a commitment to God's appointed leadership. I mean support your pastor. Where God puts you, you support your pastor. You support him. Don't talk about him. You stand behind him and pray for him every day because he's praying He's praying because he's staying up at night because he's praying for you because he's got to give an account to God for your soul. You know that? Your pastor sits up at night praying because he's got to stand for God and account for your soul. You pray for that man. And as you pray for Him, God will bless you. All God's folks said, Amen. Amen. Now, Lord Jesus, I thank You, Lord. I thank You for the for Your Word, Lord God. Thank You for the opening of Your Word. Now, Lord, I just re- I stand here and I release Your anointing to come down on Your people, Lord. I say to the devil, I bind you. I say this Word is fallen on good soil. You shall not steal it. I ask you, Lord, to open the understanding that this will bear a crop 30, 60, or 100 fold, and the devil shall not steal it. In the name of Jesus. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.